This is a quick video to lead you through the assignment on moment stress and deflection for continuous beams. So we're going to do the step-by-step -step process of setting up and executing the assignment. So in the original assignment, you were shown a diagram like this where there's a beam 30 feet long and then a continuous beam over a support, which is a total of 60 feet long. And this segment and that segment are both 30 feet. And then we have a beam that's 90 feet long with a 30 foot segment here, a 30 foot segment there, and a 30 foot segment here. And you're showing uh, or being shown a support, which is a pin joint at each end of each beam and at all of these intermediate points. You also notice there are a couple of weird little beams right here which have to be added because multi-frame refuses to do the analysis if the structures are not interconnected. And I'm not quite sure why it's set up this way because presumably it could consider this one structure and that one a different one and that one a different one and analyze each one of those individually. But for whatever reason, it insists that everything be connected together and analyzable as a single structure. So in this, the setup of this, we make each of these beams a W10 by 26. That's a wide flange, 10 inches deep by 26 pounds per foot along the length. And then these two elements, I just made the smallest elements that exist in any of the uh, structural uh, sections that are provided in the steel manual or in multi-frame. And that turns out to be a P one half or a pipe with a standard half inch dimension. And that would be the inside dimension. So the geometry is a 30 foot beam, two 30 foot beams continuously connected. So they're essentially a 60 foot beam with an intermediate support and so forth. The loads are taken to be one kip per foot, uniformly distributed along a beam. And from that, we're going to develop the following bending stress curves and deflection curves. So now we're going to go to multi-frame. We're going to get that all set up. So this is the standard window that you have. Your uh, icons up here might be uh, arranged somewhat differently. I've eliminated a bunch of the ones that we don't use too often because they take up territory and I don't want them causing the rest of the image that you have to look at to be too constrained or too small so that it's not visible. So I've kept the ones that are really crucial to what we're doing here. So I'm going to come along and I'm going to put a beam in here and I'm just throwing it in there. Um, and then I'm going to adjust the ends. So I want this end to be at minus 15 feet and Y to be at zero. And by the way, I'll remind you that in this software, Y is up. That's because the software started as two dimensional software and the customary way of plotting anything in two dimensions is Y is up and X is to the right. This software existed long before there were any CAD programs. So these people kind of set the standard that Y was up. And when they turned it into a 3D program, they put Z as the other horizontal axis. For whatever reason, the CAD people decided to abandon that standard and decided to make X and Y exist in the horizontal plane and Z in the vertical plane. So in essence, they uh, abandon the standard that was set by structural analysis software, um, but we're going to honor it because that's the way this software was laid out. So now I'm going to double click on this point and I'm going to set this end at X equals 15 and Y equals zero. And I did all that because when I look back at this diagram, you'll notice X is to the right, Y is up and Z is out of the plane. And this beam was 30 feet long going from minus 15 to plus 15 for the X dimension. 
So now we're going to go back to multi-frame and we're going to take this beam, we'll lasso it, and then we're going to go and say duplicate under geometry. And I'm sorry that this is off your screen, but down at the bottom of this long menu is an item that says duplicate. And I'm going to um, duplicate it minus 15 feet. And I'm going to take it down 10 feet so it doesn't interfere with the one above it. And actually, I'm going to just do that two times. So now I have the beams for the two span and the three span. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to say duplicate. And again, it's off your screen. Now I'm going to go 30 feet in the X direction. And I'm not changing Y. And I'm only doing it one time. So I get that. Now I lasso this. And I say duplicate. And now I'm going to duplicate that two times. By 30 feet in the X direction. And Y doesn't change. And I end up with this. I'm going to lasso all of that. And I'm going to go put pin joint supports under all those joints. So now I have the configuration that I was asked for. Except, of course, if I tried to analyze, analyze this, multi-frame wouldn't allow me because of this point that they insist that it be one structural system. So I'm going to take this icon and I'm going to put two more members in. And now I have a complete structure. These two members, I'm going to assign them a section of pipe, one half, something minimal. And I'm also going to go and release the ends. So I'm going to do member releases and I'm going to release MZ prime and MZ prime. Now, MZ prime is considered the strong axis. In the case of a pipe, it's totally symmetric, so MZ prime and MY prime are not significantly different. Um, in other words, the moment capacity and the stiffness are both equal in either direction. But from the point of view of how this program designates things, it becomes pretty critical. So. When it puts in these two slope members, it's calling the Z prime axis of the member, which is the strong axis or member, member strong axis for bending. Although in this case, it's a pipe, so we don't know the difference. But nonetheless, um, relative to the program, MZ prime is Z prime is horizontal. So now I know that we can bend this member, or excuse me, we can bend the other members here about the z-axis and not affect this pipe. So the whole point in relaxing this pipe or its interactions at the end is to allow these members, which are the crucial ones that we want to look at, it allows us to uh, allows those members to undergo whatever motion they or def deformation they want to without any interaction with these members. So I put those members in in order to force the computer to do the analysis, but I don't actually want those members interacting in any significant way uh, because it, they would alter the results that we're going to get. So those are the little pipes. These are going to be the beams that we indicated are going to be, and we're going to go up to wide flange or W sections. We're going to come down to 10 by 26, and we're going to see it like that. Now, if we wanted to see the proportions of this, we can't render it for whatever reason in multi-frame. They don't render things in any of the orthogonal views. So this is a straight on view. That's the edge on view um, from the other direction. So this is the frontal. This is the edge on view. This is the top view. Um, and if we come over here and we say control T, T, meaning we see the total image, this is what it looks like. 
but I really want to see it in frontal view because I want to have a sense of proportion. So I'm going to rotate this to right there. And I'm going to rotate this to right there. So even though this is a 3D view, I have reduced it down to a frontal view. And now I can go render it and it shows me how deep uh, those 10 by 26s look. Now, those of you who are good with numbers, you know, 10 inches is less than a foot. Um, if these beams were 30 feet long and a foot deep, they'd have a span to depth ratio of 30. We've been told in our guidelines that 28 is kind of an upper limit for what we would ever use in proportions. So we would assume that this is some lightly loaded, very shallow member, which is um, not in our standard range of sections. And that's pretty important to understanding the results that come out of this. So I'm going to hit save for that. Oops, I get this weird message that you just ignore. Uh, basically, it's telling you it won't save just using the keyboard command of Control S until you go to right here and you say save. And then it allows me to put it somewhere. So I'm going to go down in my file structure under Beams, Share and MoMA Diagrams, and I'm going to find the right folder. And I can't remember the long name of it. So I'm going to just call it, I don't want to call it junk. I want to call it Place Wayne. And it's got a bunch of other stuff and I'll just say continuity in over continuity of beams over supports. And the key thing is I put my name first and then my first name next. And that's the naming co convention that we're always going to use in this class. So I've saved that. And now in this assignment, you were told you're not going to bother getting to all the detail of dead versus self versus live. We're just going to have one load case and it's already there and it's called load case one. So now we're going to go to the load window. I'm going to hit control T and then I'm going to go to the frontal view, which is right here. And I'll hit control T again. Control T just means, um, show everything within the window. So this is our frame. Now we're going to go to load. That's our load window. Now we're going to go down to load global distributed load. Let me make sure I'm in the right place. So then I'm going to select all the beams that I want to load. And I'll go up here and I'll click load. And then I'm going to go to global distributed load. And it already says one kip per foot. That's the default, default value that came up. So I'm going to just click OK. And now I have the diagram that I was looking for, for um, that you can see in the assignment where it's a uniformly distributed one kip per foot. So now I'm going to hit Control S from the keyboard. And after the first save, you can then use Control S off of the keyboard. I don't know why the program was set up that way, but that's the way it is. So now I go to my plot window and I don't see anything there. I'm going to go to the frontal view and then I'm going to do the analysis linear and then I'm going to do control total to get everything down into view. So what this comes up with showing is MZ prime in the case of steel, 
Very few people can think of in terms of mz prime. They tend to think more in terms of bending stress. This is what we talked about when you did the sizing of simple span beams. So we're going to come over here and we're going to pick bending stress SBZ prime. This is strong axis bending stress. You'll notice we got 48.4 uh, kips per square inch in compression. We know it's kips per square inch because we read the fine print way down here. Um, our steel is rated for 50, so 48.4 is okay. An interesting point is that for the continuous two-span two beam, we end up with a positive moment, but the real big problem is this negative moment down below, and then it becomes positive again, and then goes to zero at the ends. So this negative moment is in magnitude 48.4 also, so it's equal to this. So continuity in that case didn't buy us anything in terms of increasing the strength of the beam. Um, a three-span configuration with two interior supports and continuity over those supports did buy us something because now the worst stress is 38.7 kips per square inch for the negative moment. And it's not too bad as basically 31 kips per square inch for the positive moment. Now, in the assignment, these numbers don't appear, but you're going to uh, make a screen grab uh, or a, a snip off of your screen and show these numbers. And by the way, you can toggle those numbers on and off by going here. Sometimes you have to toggle them off because there are so, not, so many numbers you can't even see the image beneath it. In our case, though, you can toggle those on, make a snippet of this, and put it into your assignment. So now we got that done. And what we've said basically is, you know, it didn't buy us anything in terms of strength or moment capacity for us to go from a one span to a two span. It helped a little bit to go to a three span, but it's nothing particularly remarkable. Now we're going to go and we're going to look at deflection. And deflection is radically different. For example, in a 30-foot beam, we would normally want to limit the deflection to um, one inch. When we double-click on this, though, and we look over here, the maximum vertical deflection is almost 4.4 inches. So... This beam is pretty deficient relative to stiffness, and that's what's going to govern the design. So when we go back, we now realize that using continuity of, over supports really helps, because when I go look at this, I'm double-clicking on that. I'm going to make this work. Now the deflection is 1.81. It's still not the one inch we're looking for, but it's a whole lot closer. I mean, 1.8 is a lot less than 4.4. So we would have to beef up the beam less in order to make this work. Um, because of some flexibility in this middle span, the three span actually is a little worse than the two span, but even then it's only 2.3. Uh, inches of deflection uh, as compared to 4.4 .4 right here. So what we conclude from this is the continuity really helps with the deflection problem. So there's a series of questions in this assignment which uh, based on this evidence you should be able to figure out the answer to it. So I'm going to leave it up to you to do that. But this takes you through how you manipulate multi-frame in order to solve this problem.